uh, in fact, we may not have met. My name is Matt. I have the privilege of being part of the staff here at New Heights. My area of uh, sort of focus is our, our global outreach, so that I, I, I am traveling a great deal, and I don't get to be here very much. My heart's very much here, but I try to represent the ministries of New Heights really around the world, and um, I consider that a, a true and genuine uh, privilege. Uh, but today, I'm a little bit of a pinch hitter, okay? And so... I just pulled a portion of scripture that has spoken very, very deeply to me, and I hope will be uh, of use to you. And I took the liberty of just sort of printing it out inside your program there. You could turn to Luke chapter 22 if you uh, prefer. Um, But uh, there's a chance for you just to sort of follow along. And uh, I want you to hear sort of the the, the hope and challenge of this particular uh, text. I, I will talk with you about sifting in this passage. And these notes, hopefully front and back, will help you just, uh, just a little bit. But the, the business uh, of the sifting that God wants to put us through is uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, important. So I'm going to show you the passage, but what I want to do is make sure that you have a bit of the context. If you've read uh, Luke's book, you know that the portion we're going to look at comes right after Jesus has had what we call the Last Supper with his uh, disciples, his apostles. Um, he has there uh, offered what we will come to call the communion ceremony, the conclusion of the Passover meal. And he's made it clear this is the last time that I'll be uh, dining with you like this until I come again in my kingdom. It has a certain air of finality and drama to it. Jesus is, speaks ahead of, uh, of his, uh, what will be happening to him. And then with all that, he then says, now there's a betrayer right here at this table. And so that inserts very high drama. And almost always with the apostles, if things get dramatic, then they respond by fighting with one another. It just is sad, but that's what they do. And so we get to see that in this uh, this passage as well. So Luke 22, starting in verse, um, verse 24. Notice what it says. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. So you start out saying, I'm not the betrayer, and before long, you're saying, I'm even a better non-betrayer than you, and uh, after a while, I'm the greatest. So Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves the good guys, the benefactor, uergetes. But don't be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who's greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's pretty good. Argue about being the greatest. Little rebuke from Jesus, but hey, don't worry. I've got a great future for you guys. Unless your name is Simon. Verse 31. Simon, this is Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, you'll strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, You'll deny three times that you know me. Well, I think uh, you know where it's all headed. You know that Peter sadly ends up denying. Um, There's a long story there. But I I, want to make sure that you see um, what's at work here. So I I gave you a little bit of a a little poem from Rudyard Kipling that I keep in my head. It's just a reminder that a good Bible study can come from just asking real simple questions of the passage. And so uh, Kipling says, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. And so what I want you to do is just go through with me and ask those kinds of questions, especially focusing on what's stated there in verse 31. Satan has asked to sift all of you. That's the, that's the challenge. So if we just ask those kinds of questions, I think we can get a, a, a little better insight. Now, I don't think you have to get too deep into it to, uh, to say, well, wait a minute, I just want to know what is sifting. And so that's the very 
first uh, thing. And I, I gave you some blanks if that'll help you fill it out a little bit. But sifting is a, a brutal breaking down of exterior strengths. Sifting is a brutal breaking down of exterior strengths. M- many of you will know that sifting is an agricultural thing. And it, it involves very much with, you know, between the grain and the husk that need to be separated, uh, beating and flailing and throwing. And it's just a very harsh process. And that, of course, is fine if you're wheat, not so great if you're a person. But here, please notice, in this case, sifting is being used as what's going to take place representatively. And here, the agent, the brutal agent, is Satan himself. So if anyone understands brutality, certainly he does. Um, But do note what's taking place. It's the breaking down of exterior strengths. You've got the grain, but it has the hull. And until that hull is broken through, you can't get to the goodness of the grain. And there is a sense that all of us need a breaking down so, so that the, the exterior strength is no longer what we rely upon. And so God, in his great wisdom, grants sifting to us. And I like to say it this way. Uh, if you're here, you get it because you've just been sifted. Okay? Uh, or... You really get it because you are being sifted. Or I hope you get it because you're going to be sifted. Okay? But that, that's important to understand. This is part of the process that God has for his, for his people. So what, what is sifting? Wow. It's a really tough process of just breaking down that external strength that we tend to rely upon. Now, notice the, the, the next one of our helpful friends asks When? When, when are we uh, sifted? Well, this is interesting because we are sifted at the critical moment in our spiritual walk. That's where we get sifted. Do you notice that's what's happening here? This is a critical moment. Jesus has met with his guys. The, 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 the whole understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is going to change. Because Jesus will no longer be the the immediately present, visible leader of this band. He will be gone, crucified, yes, resurrected, and even even ascended. But people now will just see these apostles. They won't see Jesus. So it's a critical moment. If they don't get it right, the church, as you and I know it, will never come to be. And I, I think this is so important because I think God in wisdom brings us to moments that are are sifting moments. And sometimes we get so focused on the problem and the pain, we forget that God has a purpose and a plan, and he's taking us somewhere. And if you don't keep that in mind, you won't get to where you need to be. I think there are a lot of people who are brought through sifting moments where God knows something needs to be broken down. Instead of stepping forward in faith, they they shrink back in fear, and they don't experience what God has for them. And it's a critical moment and it would allow them to, to, to move forward. So when are we sifted? Ah, a key moment in our spiritual walk. Now, if you, if you want to turn it over and just look at the next little blank there, where? Where are we sifted? Well, this is the shocking one. We get sifted at the point of our confidence and our strength. Um, that's a tough one. Simon Peter. He, clearly, he's tifted, sifted at the point of his confidence and strength. He knows how brave he is. And he's proud to tell the Lord, Lord, I don't know about all these other losers, but I'm there for you. Now, these other yo-yos, they'll probably fade, but I'm there, right? And when you hear him saying it, it, it you just can't help but sort of suppress in your head, can you? You just know it's coming, and you think, Pete, don't say that. But see, he has confidence in, 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 in his courage. And in, in, in kindness, God will strip that courage away, you see? Uh, and we have, to, we have to be wary because there are things that we come to trust in and we don't even realize that our trust has shifted. You got a great family. Good for you. It's a blessing. It's a gift. But if you're not careful, you can, be, you can begin to think, ah, Great family. Uh, I mean, look at who we are. I mean, 
me it's us we are a great family because we're great people and then God can bring a crack into a great family and you find out ah it wasn't about us it was really all about him you, you can enjoy great health if you do it's a gift you ought to thank God for it but you know it I know it it's possible after a while to think well I'm healthy because I do healthy I am healthy other people I try not to talk about them but the little people they aren't so healthy I mean look at what they do they're not me and then you get your health stripped away and you realize oh it wasn't about you it was the mercy and kindness of God See, it's just so easy. You can think, ah, I got it fixed financially and fixed. I did all the kind of right stuff. Look at how I'm doing. And then you watch gas go from two something to five something and you think, what else is going to go somewhere? And the, that, sh- that shudder in your soul that you're feeling is God sifting you to say, have you been placing your trust in your own resources or in me? And it's really important to, to, to feel that, that, that difference. So, it, it, it happens. Old Pete, he's sure of his courage. Remember what he does? I think it's what, John 18? Steps up when Jesus is arrested, pulls out his sword, whacks the ear off of the high priest's slave. Look at that. An ear. What a trophy of war, Peter. A whole ear. That's as far as his courage can take him. And sometimes God, in kindness and mercy, lets us just absolutely crash to realize, yeah, what I've been depending on isn't just going to work. Now, when God's sifting, uh, my experience is that there's sort of, sort of a three-dimensional kind of sifting that takes place. And I just mentioned these three components, the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, David has mentioned it a number of times. It's not that we see them all together in the scripture, but these concepts are very much present in the scripture. So I just want you to, to see them and think with me as we talk about them and just see the, the concept. The world is a system that won't submit to God's rule. A system that won't submit to God's rule. Now, when you say world in the Bible, sometimes you mean just the earth. Sometimes you mean the people of the earth. So you have to be very careful when you're talking about it. But there's a distinct sense in the scripture that that a special use of the world is the whole system that simply will not yield to God's rule. And you and I have to operate with a sensitivity to the fact that that not everyone or everything is in submission to God's rule. If you think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is just about political stuff, you don't get that there are spiritual issues at work there. And further, it becomes a challenge to each of us to say, well, how much do I just have this whole separate little category called politics and never realize that it's also about spirituality? And we have to be very cautious that way because we could actually be participating in a worldly understanding, you see? Notice the, uh, in a similar way the, the flesh. That's that part of ourself that won't submit, hear the theme? That won't submit to God's rule. Um, it would be great if it's just the world out there. The grand problem is the flesh in here. And that's where the problem deepens. And so every one of us has, comes to struggles in which we want to do it our way. We want to manage it our way, our resources, our plan. And God in kindness will strike that down, sift that out of us. And it can be, to be honest, a very, a very painful process. But if you're at that point where you say, you know, look, I keep banging my head on this. I just need some discipline. It may be that, you, that God is sifting you so that you re- need, come to realize what I need is some real dependence on him. Because I keep trying to generate it from within me instead of learning to really, really walk with him. Notice the last category, of course, the devil, uh, Satan. And I, I just have you notice that his name means the opposer, Satan, the opposer, um, who will not submit to God's rule. That's, that is his core story. 
And he is opposed to all that God intends to achieve. And by the way, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that means for sure he's opposed to you. You may not have that that cognition, but it would be good to understand that there's a personal evil agent who is opposed to you and to your spiritual progress. And so we we have to be sensitive to those influences that can come to us and keep us from moving, moving forward in our faith. God in mercy says, I'm going to sift some of that stuff out of you. It's not that he has anything against us. In fact, it's that he has absolutely everything for us. Now, having stated that, who, asking my next little question, who gets sifted? And that's, that's a critical, uh, that's a critical uh, concept. And I, I want to make sure that you see it, uh, particularly in this passage here. Those who get sifted are those who desire to be used by God. Those who desire to be used by God. I mean, it's important to see it. Uh, Peter wants to be used by God. Now, we're not impressed with his battle plan. That's, it. That's honest. But we do appreciate that he's like, Jesus, I'm really for you, and I want to be, to, to be involved in what you're doing. The disciples, they're, they're arguing over who's the greatest. Do you ever feel like when you, when you see, read the story to the apostles, do you feel like a little embarrassed? Like, come on, guys, don't do that. But God shows us those people so that we say concerning ourselves, oh, yeah, I'm like that. And they begin with, well, Lord, we want to be involved in your kingdom, and we don't want to be the betrayer. Before long, they end up with, yeah, you're probably a betrayer. I know I'm better than you. Right? I'm definitely better than you. In fact, I'm probably better than all of you. No, you're not, and the way we go. But it, it is their desire to be used by God. And one of the, if you're serious about your faith, I need to say something to you. If you're genuinely serious about your faith, you should stand by to be sifted. It is part of the, of the whole uh, a curriculum that God has for his people. If, in fact, you're not very serious about your faith, you may get a pass on sifting for quite a while. Do you know that? Why? Because Satan's a great strategic enemy, and he knows to fight those that are in the battle. And those, those that are in the back taking a break, it's like, yeah, I'll deal with you later. And, and so the, the more earnest we are in our faith, the more the likelihood that the, that the sifting w- w- would take place. Now, now we get to the last of our great questions. Why are we sifted? And that's the part that, that we got, we've got to get over. And in order to do that, I, I'm going to give you just a little, another portion of Scripture. But before that, I want to give you a, a key concept to you, and I hope it'll help you. And so I put down two words, ten, testing and tempting. Testing and tempting. And it's important to kind of understand those two words. When, when you hear them, you, you, you feel some difference, don't you? T- uh, testing, that's, you know, being challenged in order to improve. Tempting, uh, that's being enticed so as to be destroyed. You hear it? Now, here's the shocking thing. They're both built on the same Greek word. Uh, boy, you're kidding. No. Well, testing, see, that's something that God should be doing because he wants to build us up. Tempting, that's something Satan should be doing because he wants to tear us down. Great, same word. We, we make a little distinction between sort of the, the verb form and the noun form, um, but it, per osmos, per odso, but it's really the same, same root. So what in the world is going on? Okay, I'm a hunter. For some of you that may not be encouraging, but don't worry, if you've seen me hunt, the animal life is principally safe, okay? So, <laughs> but if, if you go out to hunt geese with me, you take a look at my shotgun, there right on the barrel of the shotgun are some real strange markings that have been hammered into the barrel, and then underneath it, two words, proof tested. It's a key, a key concept. What that means is, before they were ready to sell that gun, instead of putting a regular shotgun shell in there, they put in a super shell, one that develops way, way more pressure 
than a normal shot shell would. And then, blam, they fired the thing. And please notice, as they expected, nothing bad happened. As they expected, they now have proof, that's why they call it proof tested, that this thing can stand the pressures that will come its way. And then they stamp those marks on the barrel. You may not know this. There are people, they're usually on YouTube. And I think that tells you something right there. But they take shotguns and they load them up with super shells. Then they stand back, pull a string attached to the trigger, and are deeply disappointed that it didn't blow up. So they load it with a super duper shell. Get a little farther back, pull the trigger, listen to the blam. If that doesn't work, they super duper pack that baby. And then they're hiding behind their truck, pulling the thing. What's their goal? Their goal is to destroy. You see it? They, they're, they're tempters. They're, they are tempting that shotgun, putting it in a pressure situation in which it will be destroyed. Ah, here are the other guys. They put it under pressure, but they're testing it to demonstrate that it's worthwhile. Now, along comes Satan. And I don't like to mention Satan, but you you ought to know he's around. Martin Luther used to say, yes, there's a devil, but he's God's devil. That's an important concept to remember. Along comes Satan, sure that in his temptation he can destroy. And here comes God, who owns everything, including Satan, and says, put the pressure on, because I'm using this to demonstrate reliability. See it? And see how it works now in the story of the Apostle Paul. I gave you this little passage from 2 Corinthians 12. Paul has been talking about the remarkable experiences that he has had. Um, he's, you know, he's dealt with the Lord directly. He's been to heaven. We don't know if it was a vision of heaven or whether he was directly in heaven, but man, he's been there. And so please notice what he says because it's so great. To keep me from becoming conceited. Oh, there's the purpose. To keep me from becoming conceited. Why? Because of the surpassingly great revelations. Well, I guess so. I mean, if you're Paul, it gets a little easy to kind of be proud. Other people say, well, you know, you know, I saw something in the Bible the other day. You're Paul, you're like, mm. actually, I write Bible. I don't just read it, I write it. Oh. They say, you know, I got this real just guidance from the Lord. If you're Paul, you're like, uh, I, uh, I talk to the Lord <laughs> directly. So other people, they're like, oh, I, I, have, I think I get a better sense of what heaven is like. If you're Paul, you're like, yeah, I've been there. Actually, been there so many times, I got frequent flyer miles. It would be easy. So God, in mercy, gives him this. Please notice what, what he grants to him. There was given to me, there was graced to me, a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. Come on. We, we, we don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. There are a lot of thoughts. We can't be sure. But we do know it wasn't good. And we do know that Paul didn't like it. And here, God said, out of, out of his desire to grow Paul, he said, Satan, you're going to have Adam. There was given me, there was graced to me, a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Well, Paul, what are you going to do? Are you going to handle the, 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 the pressure by yourself? Or are you going to be able to find another way to manage it? 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, I get it. It's not how great the pressure is. It's where the pressure lies. See that? And what a difference it makes. If the pressure comes between you and the Lord, that's a terrible thing. But if the pressure pushes you closer to a deeper reliance upon him, that's a useful thing. And so although Satan meant for it to be a temptation, God, who owns the whole world, even the devil's world, said, no, I'm going to use it for a testing. Paul was sifted, and as a result, God continued to use him. So who needs to be sifted? Why should we be sifted? Look, we need it. We do, every one of us. But I also want you to see as well, just that last little line there, others need it too. And that's an important concept. You notice there in your text, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift all of you. Simon's being sifted, but it's for all of them. Simon's the one with the struggles, but it's for all of them. And if he doesn't pass the test, you know these guys are going to follow because he's the leader of the whole bunch. And so it's a, it's a very critical moment for him to, to get it right. And, you know, this is a temptation, isn't it? When you see someone struggling, sometimes, even as a believer, there's a temptation to step back and say, you know, that's his problem, that's not my problem. Right? But this passage says, no, wait a minute. His struggle is for me too. I need to, I need to step closer not push them farther away. I, I need to say, hey, how can I support you at that moment? Because when people are sifted, they're being sifted for all of us. It's a boon, it's a benefit for, for every one of us. And I just want you to see, just notice verse 32, just for one second. Please see that difference. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon. This is not plural. This is not all of you being sifted. You, Simon, have my singular attention. And I'll say this to you. If you're facing unique challenges, you have the devoted attention of the Lord Jesus Christ who always lives to make intercession for you. If you're in the midst of difficult days, you can be confident that Christ has his heart focused on you and that you, you have his full and undivided attention. I have prayed just for you, Peter, because I know how critical this is. Now, Poor Simon, he, he was sifted, and it was hard. And you see him whacking around with his little sword, and then you hear him, you know, running scared when everyone says, weren't you with him? And it's, it's, it's a very sad thing. But that sifting changed him. And when we see Simon, the next time, he's a changed man. The only sword that he wants to handle now is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he speaks with a different kind of authority. Not look at how courageous I am, but look at how great God is. And as a result, he tells what God has done, not what he's going to do. And in the process, people begin to respond truly by the thousands in faith because of who he is. I... Uh, I just think it's so critical to hear it that the follower of Christ if you're earnest in your faith listen, part of that following is making it through difficult days because God wants to take you further. I would never trivialize the pain of any person here and in and, and no way would I minimize it and say oh well just get through it and then you know, God will all make it nice I, I don't say that at all but I, but I do say that there is a way to walk deeply with God that comes by accepting these kinds of moments and saying, Lord, this came to me through your hand. There is a purpose. You do have a plan. And I want to be responsive to you in this moment. So I can't say, because I can't know what every person here is facing. Oh, let me give you just the, 
three things to do. But I, but I would say, this is a chance to stop and say, Lord, what I'm dealing with is something that's been sorted through your will. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to you in the midst of this moment. You do that. Don't be surprised if he doesn't change you, use you, because that's part of his plan. I don't know for you if it's, you know, some issue of the world, some process of the flesh, some impact of the devil. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sifting for you as there has been for me and even as there will be for me. Um, Don't be surprised. That's part of what it is to walk with him. Having said that now, I'd like to just, just take a moment and pray both with you and for you. Okay, let's do that. Lord, we want to bless your name. You are a very good God. And you are so good that you're Lord not just of the nice stuff, but you're Lord of the nasty stuff too. And what encouragement we find in that. Because if you're only Lord of the nice stuff, Honestly, there isn't much of a kingdom for you. But we bless your name. You're Lord over everything. And you're in the process of redeeming and transforming us. Please help us to believe that. Please help us to see our world in the light of your work. Please help us to see our trials in the light of your purposes. Give us grace to believe you that You know what you're doing. Deliver us, Lord, from trying to figure you out. And just give us the grace to follow you well. That's what you want. That's what we want when we're at our wisest. And so we pray you'd help us to be wise. We ask it in the great name of Jesus. Amen.